Hi guys, Miss Brittany here. Welcome to this week's edition of To Be Continued. I will be reading the first book in the brand new Wilder Lore series. It's called The Accidental Apprentice and it's by Amanda Foody. It's a tale about scary woods and the beasts that live in them and a possible, you know, new friend if you give it enough time. We're going to go ahead and start with chapter one where we learn about Barclay Thorn. Chapter one. Barclay Thorn knew almost all there was to know about mushrooms. And there was a lot to know. He knew the poisonous ones that never grew on trees. He knew the red ones with little white spots made wart bubbles up between toes. But the white ones with red spots cured warts, welts, and pustules of any kind. He knew which ones made you drowsy or loopy or could even knock you right dead if you weren't careful. You're supposed to be taking notes, Barclay hissed at Selby. Both boys were apprentices to their town's highly esteemed mushroom farmer. But because Barclay was older and smarter, he was the one in charge, and he took this position very seriously. I c can't write and walk at the same time, Shelby blubbered, clutching his quill with his whole fist. Selby was a very pink boy. He had a pink nose and pink cheeks, like a plucked chicken, a resemblance made all the worse by his buzz blonde hair and stocky frame. And nearly always, Barclay was the opposite. Though three years older, he was so short and skinny that Selby would likely outgrew him before next spring. His dark eyes looked like ink smudges on papery white skin, and his shoulder-length black hair was combed harshly to both sides, slick with oil to make it lie flat. He didn't see what was so hard about writing and walking. He doubted it was harder than reading and walking. And Barclay rarely walked anywhere without an open book on his hands. The two apprentices had been assigned an extremely important mission to find a rare mushroom called the Morning Tide Moral, and for this, they had ventured to the edge of the woods. The woods was no average wood. It was so large that no map could fit all of it, so dangerous that no adventurer dare explore it. It loomed to the west of their town like a great shadow. The trees along the edge were gray and spooky. Their trunks twisted like they'd been wrung out, and their branches reached up like claws towards the overcast sky. It was quiet except for the rustle of decayed leaves and the snaps and cracks of brittle twigs beneath boots. This was the only time to find the morning tide moral, that bleak in-between part of the year after the leaves had all fallen but before the first snow. Selby stumbled over a tree root and bumped into Barclay's back. It would be easier to write and walk if you weren't always looking over your shoulder, Barclay grumbled. But... We're so close. You know what Master Pillsman says about... We haven't gone in. The town is right there, Barclay pointed behind them to Dolshire. Their small town crouched on a knobby hill, encircled by a stone wall covered in spears, like a giant thorn bush. The people were about as friendly as thorn bushes as well. They didn't like laziness. Naps were expressly forbidden. They hated visitors. Visitors could mean tax collectors, circus performers, or worse, lore keepers. The only thing the people of Dulshire loved were rules, but they only had one rule about the woods. Never, ever stray inside. Because the woods would trick you if you let it, leading you too deep within to find your way out. And the deeper in the woods lurked the beast. But Barclay, being a dutiful apprentice, would never dream of breaking Dulshire's most important rule, especially because of how often he got in trouble for accidentally breaking so many little ones. He would do exactly what he'd come here to do, and that was to find the morning tide moral, with or without Selby's help. Barclay didn't understand why Master Pillsman had insisted Selby come along, or why he'd even taken on a second apprentice in the first place. Dolshire didn't need two mushroom farmers, and when Master Pillsman retired, it would be Barclay, not Selby, who took over. After all, Barclay made sure he was the perfect apprentice. He took detailed notes in neat cursive handwriting, he had memorized every mushroom species in the Philosopher's Field Guide to Finding Funky, Volumes 1 through 9. Even Master Pillsman himself had claimed that Barclay was the hardest working boy Dulshire had ever seen, which was why Bar Barclay refused to leave the mission empty-handed. He needed to prove to Master Pillsman that he only needed one apprentice. I'm not leaving. Not yet, Barclay declared, and he continued marching along the tree line. Selby followed, but whimpered as they walked. As the older apprentice, it was Barclay's responsibility to comfort Selby, not just to teach him. Selby had never been near the woods before, and even Barclay, as experienced as he was, still thought the twisted trees did look a bit frightening. But Barclay found it very hard to be nice to Selby. At home, Selby had many brothers and sisters who cared about him, parents who looked after him, 
a room of his own. Barclay had none of those things. He had the last one, at least, until Master Pillsman had let Selby move in. There was no orphanage in Dulshire. If you wanted supper and a bed for the night, then you had to work for it. So Barclay had grown up working many jobs. He'd stacked books in the library, recorded new rules for the lawmakers, and delivered more spears to the centuries. But even though Barclay had tried to be exceptional at everything, when it came time to choose his apprenticeship, no one in Dulshire had offered him a spot. They were too worried about the futures of their own children to care about a scrappy, rule-breaking orphan, too. And so Barclay had knocked on Old Pillsman's door and begged for the apprenticeship, a job no one else wanted. Master Pillsman had refused and refused and refused, but Barclay kept trying until he agreed. And it had been fine for two years, all until the day that Selby showed up. He still cried and fled back home every chance he got, but Master Pillsman hadn't refused him, not once. It'll be dark soon, Selby run to Barclay. Not for hours, Barclay told him. It's freezing. It's winter. What did you expect? I'm hungry. Didn't you eat lunch? I fed it to Gustav. Gustav was Master Pillsman's pet pig, who sniffed out valuable truffles hidden in the ground. Normally, Gustav would join the boys on quests such as these, but Gustav had mysteriously, mysteriously gained weight this past year. So much weight that waddling exhausted him. He spent all day napping by the fire. You've been feeding Gustav? Barclay buried his face in his hands. The mystery of the pig fattening was solved. And once again, all of Barclay's problems proved to be Selby's fault. I don't like mushrooms, Selby complained. They're slimy and they taste like dirt. Barclay could hardly believe what he was hearing. Then why are you here? He shouted. It was the very question that had bothered him for ages. He also felt personally offended. He liked mushrooms very much. Selby's pink face flushed several shades pinker, and he burst into tears. My mom said it was a good future for me. This seemed to be a lot of pressure to put on an eight-year-old. And for a moment, Barclay did feel rather bad. But Barclay couldn't get distracted. If he wanted to keep his apprenticeship, he didn't have time to feel sorry for anyone but himself. This job was the only thing that ensured Barclay really fit into Dulshire. And Dulshire, however small and rural and rule-obsessed, was Barclay's home. He would never leave it. When Barclay had been very small, before his parents had died, he used to dream of adventure. He spent hours imagining the world that existed beyond Dulshire's prickly walls, other towns and cities and kingdoms and far-flung realms beyond the woods. But his parents had loved Dulshire. They wouldn't want such a life of uncertainty and danger for their only child. And so, Barclay refused to disrespect their wishes. He tried to forget about the call of adventure, concentrating instead on how to stay, to belong. Barclay focused back on the mission, and for the next several minutes, the only sounds were Selby's teeth chattering, his nose stifling, or his stomach rumbling. As Barclay knelt to examine a promising fungus, Selby tapped him on the shoulder. Look, look. Barclay swatted him away and pulled out his forager's notebook to compare the sketch to the subject before him. He frowned. He needed a scarlet dome, but this one was clearly crimson. Mushroom foraging was a very precise science. He dug it out anyway and added to his basket. I've done it again, Barclay scolded himself, inspecting the dirt beneath his fingernails. His master pillsman hated how dirty Barclay got himself and how his hair looked wild only hours after combing it. Repeat after me, Master Pillsman would always say when he quoted Dulshire's law book, filth is prohibited. No dirt, no odor, no potty mouse. Cleanliness is orderliness. Barclay, Selby squeaked, and Barclay finally stood up and turned around. The grass between them and Dulshire was alive. With dozens no, hundreds of tiny glowing white eyes peering at them between the weeds. The piles of leaves beneath the boys' boots shuddered and shook as small figures dashed within them. Selby hopped back and forth as though he stood barefoot on hot coals. Barclay, he wailed, but Barclay was frozen, his gaze fixed on a single creature perched on a rock. It looked like a mouse, except without a tail, and with six curled spikes protruding from its back. Barclay had seen beasts before. Sometime on breezy autumn days, strong gusts of winds carried glimmering insects from the woods into the town, whose stingers turned your skin swollen and green. 
He'd spotted beasts flying in V-shapes across the sky, seeking out warmer places for the winter, and leaving trails of glittery smoke behind them. Occasionally, more vicious beasts snuck out from the woods to break into chicken coops and goat pens for nighttime feast. When Barclay was four years old, the legendary beast who lurked in the wood, named Galvador, had destroyed Dolshar on Midsummer's Day. Though Barclay had never glimpsed Galvador's face, he remembered how the town walls had crumbled from the force of his roar. Galvador had torn roofs off of homes with his jaws, sinking fangs into stone as if they were butter. His magic had caused the earth to rupture, making whatever remained of their once flat town now stand on a tilt. It was thanks to Galvador that Barclay was an orphan. Knowledge of beasts had since been forget forbidden in Dulshar. Travelers who spoke of them were turned away from inns in case they could be lore keepers. Wretched people who bonded with beasts and shared their magic. Children who played too close to the woods were punished. Even beast-related books in the library were burned, making the entire subject a mystery. I th thought bees stayed in the woods, Selby moaned. They usually do. Barclay had forged along the edge of the woods before without ever spotting a beast. But mid midwinter was only a few weeks away, and like midsummer, the holiday was known to make beasts behave strangely. Barclay took a careful step away from the mouse-like creature. He considered reaching into his pocket for the charm he kept to ward off beasts, but it was already too late for that. Don't panic, he told Selby. They're blocking our way back to town. But if we just think of... Except Selby didn't listen. Dropping his notebook and quill behind him, he turned around and shot off into the woods. Want to find out what happens next to Barclay and Selby? Check out The Accidental Apprentice, the first book in the Wilder Lore series by Amanda Foody. It's available at any of our branches, and we can always put it on hold for you if they don't happen to have it available. Visit us today, and don't forget to sign up for our summer reading challenge and add this book to your list of titles. Thank you guys, and we can't wait to see you next week.